And um, I would like to welcome everybody to this um, um, webinar. Today we have Dr. Hannah Price and she's an instrument scientist at FARM and she's been working there for the past five years. And today she will be talking about measurement of pressure and temperature at 200 hectopascal from the uh, FARM aircraft. As with uh, previous webinars, if you have any questions, please uh, do uh, send them to me via the chat privately so that we don't disturb the speakers and everyone else who's uh, listening to the seminars. And you can either um, send me your name or you can type the question and I will read it for you. I will also ask for further questions at the end of the talk. Um, these talks are recorded um, so you can um, listen to them again later. And one more thing I wanted to say is that we have now most of our talks um, booked until the end of July and we plan to have a break uh, until about mid to late September when we will restart again. When we restart, we will probably have a restarting time of around 2 p.m. So move away from the lunchtime breaks. So um, I will mute everybody during the talk and I will unmute everybody again at the end of the talk. Uh, if you want to stay muted, please uh, mute yourself again. Okay. Um, over to you, Hannah. I believe you need to unmute yourself. There we go. If you can start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Is that working? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, thanks Maria. Um, so as an instrument scientist at FAM, I maintain and calibrate and repair and improve some of the core instrumentation on the aircraft. Um, I look after a lot of the MET instruments, so that's why I'm going to talk about temperature and pressure today. Um, so we'll start off with, why would you measure temperature and pressure? Apart from the obvious, it's an atmospheric research aircraft. So of course you want to know what the temperature and pressure is. Temperature and pressure measurements also tell you about how fast the plane is going. You can combine them to find the air density. Um, if you measure pressure at different points on the aircraft, that tells you about the wind speed and the direction. And of course, if you're a pilot, the, the pressure is what you use to know what height to fly the plane at. Oh, I'll take two. Um, so these are the sort of fundamental building blocks of quite a lot of the other measurements on the aircraft. If you want to cal calculate the relative humidity, for example, you need to know what the temperature and pressure are. Um, for calculating the concentration of gases and aerosols, part of that measurement is knowing what the temperature and the pressure is. Um, similarly, if you want to correct for temperature and pressure effects on instrumentation, then you need to measure them. Um, and for flux measurements, and knowing what volume of air an open path cloud or aerosol instrument has, has seen as well. And then finally as well, converting between standard and volumetric flows. Um, but why, why am I talking about it? Measuring temperature and pressure is, is easy, right? It's a straightforward sort of basic measurement. And well, it is on, on the ground, more or less, although measuring temperature on the ground is actually still quite, quite tricky to get it absolutely right. Um, but we're on an aeroplane and that's sort of the problem. We are whooshing along at 200 miles an hour and that disturbs things and makes the things that you're trying to measure change and it makes the measurement really quite difficult. So we'll start off with pressure, start off with static pressure. And by static pressure, I mean the pressure of the air as if we weren't there disturbing things. But unfortunately, well, we are there disturbing things because we've come along and pushed our way through the air and the air has to flow around the plane. 
So that pushing all of the air out of the way means that the pressure almost anywhere on the surface of the plane is going to be different from what it would have been had we not been there. So that means that wherever you choose to make your measurement of static pressure on the aircraft, it'll almost certainly be wrong in the sense that it won't be the pressure that would have been had we not arrived. And that difference between the pressure that you want to know and the pressure that you actually measure is the static source error. And that's quite important to characterize properly. So down here on the bottom right, we've got some CFD results from Nick Lawson at Cranfield University. And it shows the pressure contour over the surface of our aircraft. And you can see that that orange on the nose implies that the pressure at the very front of the aircraft is increased relative to elsewhere and above the wings for example it's decreased as you would expect but these pressure contour the the various distributions of pressures over the surface of the aircraft vary with flight conditions so they vary with um, altitudes how fast the plane is going so not only do you have to very carefully choose where you make your pressure measurement, but you also need to know how that choice of position is affecting the measurement at different altitudes and different speeds. So this is done by properly characterizing the static source error. And you do that by, for example, tower flybys, although there's a limit to how many altitudes you can characterize using a tower on the ground. Um, or attaching some sort of reference pressure measurement to the aircraft. Um, one way of doing this is to attach a trailing cone. So that's essentially just a big long tube out of the back of the aircraft, stabilized by a cone, and it's attached to a pressure transducer inside the aircraft. And that means that the position where you're making the pressure measurement is well behind the aircraft and well behind its aerodynamic influence. So that gives you a reference pressure measurement to use to characterize your on aircraft static pressure measurement. If you can't do that, then maybe comparison with a pacer aircraft is the way to go. Fly alongside an aircraft with a trusted pressure measurement. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit more about that later. Um, but first, let's have a look at our aircraft and where the static pressure measurement is made. You can see just about, um, there's a little dot underneath where the pilots sit. There's one on each side. Do you know, there's surprisingly few images of the aircraft from the other side. They all seem to be from this side. Anyway, that's where the static pressure measurement is, is made in that that's where there's a hole in the side of the aircraft. And there's a tube coming from each of those two symmetrical holes. They join together and they get input to a pressure transducer that converts that pressure into a voltage. On our aircraft, we, we use what's called the RVSM static pressure measurement for science. Don't worry about what RVSM stands for, it's a really unhelpful acronym, but the main thing is that it's the pressure measurement that was intended always for flying the aircraft. It's there so that the pilots know what height to fly at and what speed the plane's flying at. Um, it was never intended for science. It's maintained by the aircraft engineers because it's there for aviation purposes. It's there to make sure we don't crash into other aircraft. Um, and so the requirements that it has to meet are stringent. So we know it's a good measurement, but it's not a science measurement. It's not looked after by a scientist. And we don't have sight of its calibration. We know that the engineers check it, but that's not the same thing as a calibration. Um, we don't have much sight of the static source correction. So it's really hard for us to assess its uncertainty. We know that the uncertainty is low because we, we know that it's a good measurement, but we also know that the static source error isn't quite completely corrected for. I can go into details of how we know that and, and why that's the case. Um, but the, the main thing is there's a residual error that's small enough that you wouldn't need to worry about it for flying the plane, but we're there to make a really accurate science measurement. So 
the idea is to do better than that in future. Um, before I go on to how we're going to do better than that, I just wanted to look at the other pressure measurements on the aircraft. By making measurements of pressure at different points on the aircraft, you can gather information about how fast it's going and the winds. So we've got a picture here with some people for scale. Again, showing the RVSM static pressure port just below where the pilots are. Below that is the S10 science static pressure port, another hole connected to a tube. Um, so you might be thinking, but she said a minute ago that we don't have a science static pressure measurement. Well, we don't, but we do have a port. The problem is it's not connected to a transducer that measures the absolute pressure there. At the front of the aircraft, right on the nose, we've got five more ports. They're called the turbulence probe. There's a center one, um, an upper or lower, and one to the left and one to the right. And they are connected to three differential pressure transducers in this, this tray here, just in front of the, the cockpit. Um, so they're different from the pressure transducers that measure static pressure because they measure a difference between two input pressures rather than telling you what the absolute pressure that they see is. So zooming in on that tray, I'm afraid this, this is a bit of a messy slide, but hopefully you can see the three different pressure transducers, these three black boxes I'm pointing to. Um, and each one of those is connected to two of the holes, two of the ports in the aircraft. So the furthest away one measures the difference between the left and the right port in the radome. The middle one measures the difference between the upper and the lower. And this near one measures the difference between the center port and the S10 static port. So that's what the S10 static port is used for at the moment. Combining all of these measurements tells you um, about the angle of attack, angle of side slip, and eventually, after some processing, what the winds are doing. So they're really useful measurements to make um, for lots of purposes. So back to how we're going to improve the pressure measurements. I've said we need a science static pressure measurement in, instead of using that RVSM pressure measurement. And we've seen that we've got a science static port the only thing that's lacking is a science static transducer of that port. It's only connected to a differential measurement at the moment. So the plan is to install a static transducer, an absolute pressure measurement at that S10 science port. It'll go alongside those other transducers in the same tray. And it will now be our science static measurement. Of course, once it's fitted, it's not going to be useful immediately because we need to characterize that static source error. Um, to do that, there are a few options, one of which is to add a training cone to the FAM aircraft. Failing that, we might use um, a different aircraft as a reference. So the German Aerospace Center, DLR, have done a huge amount of very detailed work on characterizing the static source error on their halo aircraft. And we were lucky enough to have um, some of their scientists come over and tell us all about what they've done last summer. Um, and they're quite enthusiastic about working with us and using the halo aircraft as a pacer for us to fly alongside to characterize our static source error. So those options are still up in the air at the moment, but that's the sort of thing that we're looking at doing. Um, so that's pressure. Let's go on to temperature. Um, I'm talking about static temperature here again. It's the temperature of the air if we weren't there disturbing things. That's the temperature that you want to know. Um, and when you're on an aircraft whooshing along really fast, the time response, the frequency with which you're able to make the measurement, is the thing that dictates the spatial resolution of your measurement. So one thing you need from that temperature sensor is something with a low firm, thermal mass, which changes its temperature really quickly. Something like that tends to be quite fragile because it's small and it's got to have lots of contact with the air. Um, what you also want is that the sensor doesn't get wet, it doesn't get battered by cloud and aerosol particles. 
So let's put it in a housing. So over there we can see the, the two housings that make the main temperature measurements on the fan aircraft. The one, the shiny one is non-de-iced and the, the not shiny one is de-iced. It's got a heater to stop it clogging up with ice. So the sensors are protected in, in the housing, that's good. Um, but when the air flows through the housing to where the actual sensing element is, the air gets compressed and it slows down. And what happens when you compress air and you slow it down is that you warm it up. And, and in these housings, it warms up by a lot, by up to 15 degrees, which is pretty annoying because we wanted to know what its temperature was. We're trying here to measure the temperature of the air and we've just warmed up the air. So we need to find a way around that. And to do that, we characterize how it warms up. Um, sorry for including an equation, but this, um, this temperature that we measure, the, this warmed up temperature of the sensing element itself, Ti, is related to the static air temperature, the one that we want to know, Ts, by the recovery factor, which is more or less the degree to which the air is slowed down in the housing, and the Mach number, which comes from the static and the dynamic pressure measurements. So let's pause there to acknowledge that getting the temperature right on the aircraft depends on having a really good measure of pressure. So that's why it's important that we put a lot of work into getting that pressure measurement right, because a lot of other things depend on it. Anyway, back to temperature. That warmed up temperature of the sensor itself, that's fairly well understood. We can measure that quite accurately. I take the sensors themselves to MPL once they've done a certain amount of flying and they, MPL being the National Physical Laboratory in London, they get calibrated there. So the uncertainty in that temperature is quite small. Where there's room for improvement is in the recovery factor and in the Mach number. So to improve the recovery factor, um, I've done some work looking at lots of past data and found that what we need is more data to properly understand the recovery factor. And in particular, there's um, a need for more data at higher altitudes. It's a bit sparse up there. There are measures of recovery factor. So I've got some plans to do um, test flying. Hopefully one of the next um, flights that the FAM aircraft does is going to be a recovery factor test flight where we can make more measurements of, of this quantity. It's inherent to the housings themselves. Um, so it is something that you need to measure um, by doing a test flight. The Mach number, as I've said, comes from those pressure measurements. Um, we talked earlier about how we're going to improve them. Um, but how are the actual measurements made? Well, the PRT sensors originally, PRT standing for platinum resistance thermometer. So it's a piece of platinum that changes resistance with temperature. We measure how the resistance change, changes, so we know the temperature change. Um, the top photo in in the top left there um, shows me holding one of the housings. It's a de-ice one. You can tell by the big, big heater cable there. And in my right hand, I've got one of the sensor holders. Um, so it sits inside the housing perpendicular to the airflow. And on the top right there, you can see it next to a 20p piece. Um, it's just about the size of a pencil. The sensing element sits right at the end. Um, these two bottom photos show those sensing elements. On the bottom left, we've got the original one. Um, we call them looms because they're um, a, a loom of platinum wire, really thin wire wound around a mica support. They're really fast response because that wire is so, so thin. Um, but actually the time response is quite complicated because you get the time response of the wire and also the time response of the mica support itself. Because the wire is so thin it's really really fragile so it's quite easy to break. The calibration can drift as well. Sometimes you get a situation where two of the sort of rungs of the ladder touch each other so you get something like a short circuit and that affects the measurement in, in a huge way. Um, 
and they can just fail suddenly as well so if that happened you've lost your temperature measurement from one housing for the rest of the flight you need to replace the the sensor itself um, on top of all of that they're not made anymore um, and if we wanted to have one made it would cost thirty thousand thirteen sorry thousand um, dollars not that we do want to have them made because of all those issues that i described there on the bottom right there we've got uh, an alternative this was developed by alan woolley quite a few years ago now and it involves removing that platinum loom and replacing it with commercially sourced thin film PRTs. These are low cost, um, they can be made in-house or mounted in-house, um, they're robust, their calibration doesn't seem to drift over time, so they are a really good solution. The only drawback of these is that they're much slower response than the loom original sensors. So if you have a look at the plot on the bottom right there, we've got a temperature time series with loom data, original data shown in red, and plate, that's the new one, um, shown in white. And you can see that the loom is able to resolve much, much more temperature variation um, in terms of time than the plate is. So Although the plate is slower, it's not actually that slow still. If you look at the x-axis here, each um, marker is one second difference. So this is still, in the grand scheme of things, quite a fast temperature measurement. And it's really robust. So it does meet a lot of our users' requirements. It's, it's a good temperature measurement. But some people do need that, that fine resolution of the loom. So we've got an alternative solution um, being developed, almost finished really at FAM now, um, in the form of thermistors. So again, it's the same principle. We remove that original platinum loom from an original sensor holder, but this time we replace it with a thermistor. So the actual sensing bit itself is that tiny little glass bead on the end of a shot resistant glass rod. Initial tests show that these are faster response measurements than the, um, the plate and comparable with the original loom. So we've got another te temperature time series here. This time the loom's in red and the thermistor now is in white. And you can see that it does resolve the fine structure in a similar way to the loom. Um, we do have issues with electronic noise on the thermistors. There are much higher resistance than the PRTs. So we're trying to measure this, this high resistance um, using a circuit, which is halfway down the aircraft, when the actual sensor itself is at the front of the aircraft and the aircraft itself is full of electronic noise. So it's quite difficult to actually make this resistance measurement to the work out what the temperature is. Um, but Duncan McLeod at FAM is developing a new circuit um, that's on the way to being ready to test in the lab and hopefully that will overcome a lot of the noise issues. And once we've overcome the noise issues we can do some really detailed analysis of what the time response of the thermistors is and how that how that's comparable with the looms. The other issue with the thermistors is they self-heat which again, more of this heating of the thing that you're trying to measure the temperature of is not, not helpful in a sense. So what, again, you need to do is to characterize it. To do that in the calibration lab, at MPL again, you can alternate the voltage so that you can understand how the, vol how the increase in voltage increases the amount of self-heating. Um, that's fine, it gives you good calibration and it tells you what your self-heating is in relatively still air. But then we're using these thermistors on the aircraft with the air whooshing over the sensor. It's going to, going to be different than in the calibration lab. So we need to measure it in flight as well as on the ground. So the way I've done this is by alternating the voltage every five seconds in flight. Um, over the course of 82 flights, and that gives us 100,000 measures of self-heating. You can sort of see how this works on the plot on the left there. The voltage is 
alternating and the sort of raw thermistor data is shown in red there. You can see how the self-heating works. It increases when you increase the voltage and decreases when you decrease the voltage. So those 100,000 measurements um, tell us loads of information about how this self-heating works. So I've been able to really dig down to look at the various dependencies of this self-heating, what, what affects it, um, what doesn't affect it, which is more surprising, um, and to work towards having a parameterization for the self-heating that we can use to produce a really good temperature measurement at the end. And it turns out that there are two main things that affect the self-heating on the aircraft. One of them is the dissipation properties of the sensor itself. And that's something we've noticed to begin with in the calibration lab at MPL. There are sensor to sensor variations in the self-heating. So you can apply the, the same current to the sensor and different ones will heat by a different amount. We think that's to do with the actual physical nature of the sensor itself, the, the glass covering, the, the bead. Um, but we can gain some quantitative information about that in MPL and use that for the measurement on the aircraft as well. The other thing that the self-heating depends on is the temperature of the thermistor itself, which sounds horrendous, but it makes sense when you think about it. The, the temperature varies with resistance, that's what makes it a thermometer, um, and by varying the resistance you vary the current, and by varying the current you vary the amount of power that's dissipated in the sensor itself. So that's, that's how it works. And because we know what the resistance is, we're measuring it, we can have some information about what we think the self-heating ought to be. So combining that information gather, gathered from the resistance and the information about the dissipation properties, I've produced this parameterization, um, which is applied to the red data on the plot there to produce the black data. And you can see that the removal of the self-heating using this parameterization um, pretty much removes that whole sig um, stepping signal that you can see. And it produces a temperature measurement which compares really well with the PRT measurement being used in the other housing. Um, so to summarize, these fundamental measurements of temperature and pressure, they, they might seem quite boring and they might sometimes be quite boring but they are really important to get right. It's really hard to do them because of the effect of the aircraft whooshing through the air. We're changing everything by being there. We're changing the pressure and by forcing the air to move through the housings we're warming it up. Um, so we do need to put a lot of effort into making sure these measurements are right and that's why it's an area of ongoing work. Um, the improvements that are coming soon are that new science static pressure transducer um, being installed um, at S10, followed by calibration flights to make the actual pressure measurement any use. Um, we've got dedicated test flying coming up to refine that temperature recovery factor. And also our new thermistor sensors are getting a new circuit soon to um, reduce the amount of electronic noise they're susceptible to. Um, that's everything I had to say. Um, has anyone got any questions? Thank you very much, Hannah. That was a very interesting uh, overview of something that a lot of us give for granted, like measuring pressure and temperature. Uh, right, I have a few questions um, that have been asked to me. In the meantime, I will unmute everybody and please do mute yourself again um, if you uh, wish to remain muted. Um, so the first question I have is a question from uh, Ben uh, and he's asking, um, can the Mach number come from very accurate GPS measurements? The what we're interested in in the Mach number is the, the speed of the aircraft relative to the air, not necessarily relative to a geometric position on the ground. 
So that's why we use pressure measurements for it, because we're interested in how we're moving relative to the substance that we're surrounded by. And being an aeroplane, we're surrounded by air. So it's less to do with your position on the ground and more to do with your position relative to the air. GPS measurements could be useful if you knew the wind as well, um, but there are added complications there in knowing what the wind is. You might have some pressure measurements involved in knowing what the wind is. So basically you do need pressure measurements to do it. Okay, thank you. We have a second question from Till. And the question is, can wave disturbances occur in the tubes leading from the aircraft surface to the actual sensors? Yes. Yeah, that's something that, um, that is thought about when they're developing these sensors. It's not something I know a huge amount of, about in detail, but it is a, a thing that can happen, yeah. Okay, I was quite curious, um, to know that you have two uh, temperature measurements in two different housing and one is um, got de-icing and the other one doesn't. I was just wondering, what do you use the one without de-icing? Is it only when you fly very low or do you do something with that measurements when the ice is getting on the sensor? Um, so the, the two housings are, are very similar most of the time. We only actually turn the heater on in the de-icing housing when we're in icing conditions. We have a person on board the aircraft that one of their jobs is to turn the heater on when we go into icing cloud. Um, one of the advantages of the non-de-iced housing is that it's got a smaller inlet and so the probes that are in there, the sensing elements themselves, are much less susceptible to damage. We tend to go through sensors a lot more quickly on the de-icing one, which is sort of counterintuitive because you'd think it's de-iced so they're, they're, they're not icing as much, but actually they, the flow through the bigger hole is, is more damaging to the sensors. Okay, thank you. There's uh, another question from Garam. Garam, do you want to ask a question? Hi, hi Hannah. Nice talk. Hiya. Thanks. There's a thing called the laser air motion sensor which the Americans have, have, have built and uh, well, you're familiar with this but I'll, I mean it's basically pointing a laser ahead of the aircraft and you and you measure the speed with respect to the fluid. I mean I think that's the idea isn't it? And, mm. and how useful would a thing like that be for your trying to untangle these various um, parameters that are <coughs> depend on each other. Yeah, it would be very useful. Um, in fact, I've been talking to Phil Brown at the Met Office this, this morning about the idea of fitting the static transducer and he said, oh, you know what you need is the LAMS to be part of the pressure source error characterization. What it needs though is um, optical fibres in the in the wings, which I understand is tricky. Yes, but, but given the midlife upgrade that's about to, well, <laughs> given that we're, we're supposed to have a midlife upgrade, um, things become possible that wouldn't normally be possible. So yeah, okay, that's yeah. useful. But you, you definitely like one if it, if, you know, feel possible, yeah? Oh yes, please. <laughs> okay, good. Right, we have one more question from uh, Scott. Um, in the chat, he says, rockets heat up on re-entry. Is velocity dependent temperature noticeable? Um, well, yes, that, um, the relationship between the, the warmed up sensor, warmed up temperature of the sensor itself and the static air temperature is Mach dependent. So the, the speed is a huge part of, of how much um, that temperature increases at the sensor itself. And Mach varies um, with altitude. It's higher, the higher we go, um, because the speed of sound changes. Um, so yeah, the, the speed is really important in, in how, how we work out what the temperature is. Right. Um, if there aren't any further questions, I would like to thank Hannah again on behalf of everybody here for a really nice and interesting talk. And I would like to uh, just let you know that next week we have Chris O'Reilly will be giving this seminar again at 1pm on Wednesday. 
and uh, there will be seminars up until the end of July. All the slots have now been filled up up to the end of July. If you would like to give a talk, please let us know and we will try and get a nice and exciting um, schedule of webinars again uh, starting in uh, mid to late September. Uh, we might also have, as I said before, uh, a new uh, time slot for the webinars and we were thinking about 2 p.m. Uh, on Wednesdays to avoid the lunchtime uh, and make it um, easier for people to attend uh, as a consequence of the survey that has been sent uh, through by Yankas. So thanks again everybody and I will probably see you again sometime soon. Bye. Thank you.